people are challenging the core values of the Islamic theocracy. People are demanding a meaningful, fundamental change. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Harrison Griffiths and I'm Communications Officer at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Joining me today is Mohammed Machine, a senior lecturer, le senior research scholar at the Centre for Governance and Markets at the University of Pittsburgh. Today we will be discussing the developing situation in Iran, with protests erupting against the theocratic regime over the past few months. Mohammed, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. So, give us a little overview. What has been happening in Iran for the last few months? Sure. Um, almost anybody that comes to Iran makes the same observation that uh, even the core values of the regime is very much incompatible with the culture, the value, uh, values of the society at large. For example, alcohol is readily available, as uh, I remember some a, a writer in The, the Economist uh, mentioned it. Hijab isn't taken seriously, as I'm sure these days everybody can tell. And then if you step inside people's private lives, there's no hijab inside the private life. That is not to say there's no modesty, that, that is not to say uh, there are no social values in dressing respectfully. Uh, there are codes, there are limits. But if you have seen any videos from the morality police in Iran, a lot of young women are arrested at the, in the presence of their parents. When Mahsa Amini was arrested, she was with her brother. So this creates an unpleasant situation in which almost everybody living an ordinary life technically is a criminal. Law-abiding citizens in any other situation have to break the law, for example, to access their uh, social media. Young people especially, young women in particular, they find themselves at odds with all sorts of restrictions being forced upon them. Uh, the kind of restrictions that are not regarded as values within the institution of family or among friends. Uh, I remember a survey, uh, a survey um, tried to uh, make sense of this and found out that only 15% of Iranian people approve of uh, mandatory hijab, which is a very contested issue these days. And uh, I assure you those 15%, and those numbers of course are amplified uh, because otherwise uh, are not publishable, uh, they, they couldn't even publish it if uh, they... Uh, yeah, if, uh, if, they want to, if they wanted to, to bring out research like that, they, they wouldn't be allowed to, they'd be censored in doing so. Exactly, yeah. absolutely. And uh, another survey uh, done by the hardliners within the regime found out that more than 70% of people are completely against mandatory hijab. So what does it mean? It means a huge majority of families versus the law of the land. So basically, the laws have no legitimacy in the society and enforcing them creates uh, an unpleasant reaction. Uh, and that's exactly what's happening, what's been happening uh, in, in the past few months in Iran. Yeah, and uh, we've seen before uh, most notably in 2009, that people have risen up against the uh, Iranian regime and uh, unfortunately the brutality and authoritarianism of the ruling class in the Islamic Republic have suppressed that. Firstly, why has this happened now if the tension between uh, the Islamic theocracy and the values of most people in Iran have been in tension for so long? And secondly, do you think that this can now finally be successful, that the people in Iran can free themselves? Um, two very important questions. 
First of all, uh, if you look uh, in the past, because I've been asked by many people in the United States, for example, uh, that you guys are having protests every other year or almost every year now these days for the past uh, four or five years, especially. Uh, so basically people are protesting and then uh, those uh, protests, uh, protests are uh, um, crushed by the regime and people go back to their homes and uh, next time something happens people again protest that's not exactly what's happening uh, you mentioned uh, protests in 2009 because uh, the uh, islamic theocracy as you uh, very well put it has a pretense of democracy People have been trying for a long time to reform the country, to change the country by using democratic processes, by democratic institutions. Uh, in 2009, people were trying to vote in order to elect someone uh, that was mildly sympathetic to their demands. And uh, because uh, within the current uh, political structure, not uh, not ev everybody cannot really run for office and uh, only a few can uh, actually run for office. But even among them, uh, the regime doesn't really, the regime didn't allow for someone from within. Uh, the prime minister uh, from the time of Ayatollah Khomeini, they didn't allow him to become president. They disqualified uh, Ayatollah Hashemi Rafsanjani. He, uh, he was a two-time president. He was a uh, uh, speaker of the parliament for many years. Uh, he was the head of the uh, Expediency Council and uh, other, uh, he was one of the main core uh, uh, highest people in the revolution of 1979, but even they disqualified him at the end. Uh, so what I'm saying is uh, people have been trying peaceful ways to uh, change the country, to reform the country, but uh, none of those uh, peaceful attempts has been fruitful. So over time, uh, the struggle has been that has become uh, more difficult and uh, unavoidably more violent, unfortunately. Uh, and until now, and these days, people's demands are not really feasible within the uh, current political structure because uh, people are challenging the core values of the Islamic theocracy. And people realize that, people realize that their demands are not really feasible or possible within the current political structure. Nonetheless, people are demanding a meaningful fundamental change. Uh, yeah. And so, go, go, go on, please. Uh, I wanted to just mention we can get more into this because this is a very important question to the second part of the question. You mentioned uh, has it been successful? I think it has. It already has been successful in many ways. For example, uh, for a long time, because the Islamic Republic, the, the Islamic revolutionaries, the radical theocracy has been recognized by the world as legitimate uh, ruling, uh, as legitimate rulers of Iran. Uh, basically, uh, in the international community, Iran is the Islamic Republic. And for that, a lot of policies against the Islamic Republic, against the regime, which has been troubling not only Iranian people, but the world at large, uh, a lot of those policies have been actually targeting people, Iranian people. And nowadays, uh, Iranian people have uh, distancing themselves from the regime. And we see some uh, recognition in the international community as well uh, in that regard. So I think that is success, uh, successful. Uh, and I think that there is a great deal of more uh, things to be said about the achievements of the recent uh, protests. And uh, I think uh, there are even more to come. Excellent. And 
revolutions in, across the Middle East previously have given those of us who are uh, pro-Western, pro-liberal, pro-democracy a lot of hope uh, and unfortunately not delivered on that original hope. Uh, and revolutions, just by the fact of what they are, can often be uh, dangerous and run contrary to liberal values. For those of us uh, in the West who are uh, pro-free markets, who are liberals and libertarians, why should we be excited about the movement against the Islamic theocracy in Iran? Um, this is a, a, an interesting question. I think the main difference is uh, the Iranian society. It has fundamental differences with uh, some of our, uh, some other societies in the, in the region. And uh, that I believe has to do with, uh, let me put it this way. Personally, I don't believe in uh, top-down state building, if you will, exporting, uh, political system and institutions uh, to countries like, for example, Afghanistan or Iraq uh, to an extent in order to build a more democratic, a, a free country. I believe it's the other way around. It's bottom up. Without widespread values of liberty in a society, I think it's impossible to build a free society. But uh, I, I do realize it sounds uh, self-evident, but uh, I'm afraid uh, seems that these uh, uh, introduction, promotion, defense of uh, ideas and values of liberty is often neglected, especially uh, in uh, some of the examples of I provided. Uh, they're always secondary to uh, top down. Uh, exporting institutions and uh, political systems, as I mentioned. Uh, in that sense, I think uh, the Iranian society is uh, well ahead. The values, the ideas are widespread. People believe in it. And there's no denying that uh, the current movement in Iran has very pronounced uh, liberty-oriented uh, uh, tendencies. To it. And uh, it is evident in people's chants, in people's demands, in, uh, and uh, Iranian people, I think, know, uh, understand the importance of individual autonomy uh, better than a lot of places in the world. I think this is, we cherish it because we knew it. We um, were, at one time, we were quite familiar with those. Uh, uh, with the benefits of uh, such liberties and uh, freedoms. And uh, we miss them. Also, when it comes, for example, to commerce, to uh, free markets, again, the institutions are there. Although the, uh, the regime has been trying to eradicate those institutions and those traditions for a long time now, uh, still people are trying to uh, revive to uh, you know uh, those uh, institutions and traditions so long story short i believe uh, the iranian society uh, these values these ideas are familiar to them they they are widely uh, widespread they are widely accepted and uh, people uh, and, and you can it is very very much evident in people's demands yeah, and and what are what are some of these the the particular core liberal values that you identify there? Of course, free speech and and the the uh, secularization almost of Iran uh, are clear to anybody who pays even the smallest amount of attention to be very high on the priority list for the movement against the regime. But are there are there any other? liberal values uh, that, that underpin the uh, the movement you, you mentioned free markets for example uh, is is the iranian state hostile to, to free markets the regime is the regime is notoriously isolationist 
And uh, well, when they established uh, the, this uh, Islamic theocracy back in uh, 1979, a post-revolution, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini was not really interested in the machinery of government, the, the economic system. He wasn't really interested in that aspect of it. And uh, the revolutionaries uh, had different factions to them. We had uh, secular Marxists uh, among revolutionaries, a big part of, especially among the educated revolutionaries of the time. Uh, on the other hand, we had uh, religious um, revolutionaries. For example, a big part of it, they called themselves God-fearing socialists. They tried to um, make uh, the marriage between uh, Islam and socialism happen for a long time. Uh, in any case, after the revolution, those ideas became, uh, uh, they basically, they put those ideas uh, to practice. They nationalized more than 95% of the industries of the country. They created a very much controlled central planned economy. And uh, 40 plus years later, Iranian people realized that uh, that sort of uh, economic system doesn't really work. We have, uh, for example, price fixing in every aspect. Everything has a, a fixed price in Iran. And uh, people, know it better than I think anywhere else in the world that that system doesn't really work. And uh, especially that we had free markets for not hundreds, but thousands uh, of years. And uh, those institutions are not only very much present in uh, Islam, in early Islam, but even before that in the Iranian culture. So we have a uh, strong tendencies, and Ayatollah Khomeini in that way, by the way, because I realize a lot of people would say that uh, wasn't he uh, a religious authority? He was, but he was not a traditional uh, mujtahid in, in that, but he was very radical. Uh, and uh, his ideas were never accepted or widely popular among uh, even the religious authorities in Shia sects, uh, much less in uh, the Islamic world in other sects in Islam. Uh, so that is when it comes to uh, free market, there are many aspects uh, that people uh, reject completely. Protectionism, protectionism is uh, again, uh, one of the main things when the core practices in the uh, current political system and people reject it. Uh, but especially you, you see those demands, especially in uh, not only the economic side of things, but also in the social aspects of ordinary life. Because um, Ayatollah Khomeini was never content with ruling uh, the political system and the military and the militia and economics. He wanted to rule over hearts and minds of Iranian people. And uh, Iranian people have felt it for a long time now, and they reject it. They want individual autonomy. They want individual freedom. And uh, this you see in a lot of, in, a lot, in many aspects of uh, ordinary life. Uh, I, I mentioned they nationalized more than 95% of the industries, but uh, also arts, for example, are not only sponsored mainly by the uh, regime, but very much tightly controlled by the regime. So even if you're a poet, if you're a painter, if you're a filmmaker, if you're an artist in general, or in other aspects, uh, the sports, all the uh, major sports uh, teams are owned and controlled by the government. So uh, even when it comes to sports, people want uh, government out of sports. People want government out of art. People want government out of uh, uh, everything, basically. And uh, that is why uh, introduction, promotion, and uh, promotion of uh, libertarian ideas have been uh, so successful in Iran. When we started, we didn't expect it to be this popular. But yeah, uh, no, I, I sort of I want to pick up on that a bit. You talk about what sounds like uh, 
a great spirit of liberty that is now really coming to a head in Iran. Uh, a lot of people, including liberty minded people, would not have known that before. What has the liberty movement looked like in Iran? How long has it been going in its modern form? Uh, and how, in, how important have, were those foundations in laying the groundwork for what we see today? To give you a sense, when I got started uh, being neighbor to Soviet Union, all of the Marxist literature were readily available in Iran. Some of it actually officially sponsored by the Soviet Union. And uh, you see its manifestation, as I mentioned before, in the revolution of 1979 and uh, how uh, the revolutionaries tried to organize the country after they seized power. On the other hand, however, some of the most important liberal literature had never been translated or talked about in Iran. And uh, the few that had been actually uh, translated were out of print for years, and there was no demand for it. However, um, these days, I usually give the example of the late George A. Smith, uh, but I think it is also true, for example, when it comes to Eamon Butler, uh, both prominent authors in their own rights, but I assure you that uh, George H. Smith is much more celebrated in Iran than he is in the United States. I realize that Eamon Butler is popular in UK, but the impact of his work, in my opinion, can be felt much more in Iran, partly because uh, the um, battleground of ideas is not as saturated, probably, as uh, it is in the UK, EU, or US, for that matter. Um, let me give you an example. My latest translation of his work, 101 Liberal Thinkers, cannot be reprinted because of its anti-state implications. So uh, we're talking about an accessible read on the history of thought in liberal tradition, and I don't think anywhere else in the world, uh, that book could be considered a threat to the political system. But it is exactly the case but, uh, in uh, Iran. Um, it's, it's how you know you're doing something right, isn't it? When, uh, exactly. When, the, when uh, a regime as, as brutal and insecure as that in Iran decides that a book is sufficiently subversive and dangerous you know you're probably along the the right lines when it comes to the ideas that are in the book absolutely because people uh, pick certain parts up and publish it on social media and talk about it and uh, there are book clubs in which people discuss these ideas and debate these ideas and uh, they of course they make peril because when i got started uh, i started Personally, I was fed up with rites and rituals, minutes of hate uh, that I had to endure in high school. So I was very much interested in religious freedom. And uh, I, I tried to read about it and there was not much uh, literature available on, uh, on that topic. Uh, but somewhere I read the mention of this guy, John Locke. And uh, so I, a couple of years later, thanks to internet, I found it. Uh, and uh, I, I started reading it, uh, and I couldn't, to be honest with you, it was a difficult read for me. So I had to buy a, another, a, a second, a bigger dictionary in order to be able to understand it. And uh, I started writing it down to, in, in order to piece it together and understand for sure what it meant. I, what I end up, uh, ended up with was a more or less translation, or at least the most difficult parts of uh, his work. And that's how I got started uh, um, translating and publishing uh, uh, stuff in Iran. But a couple of years later, I discovered that uh, I could pick and choose if I was careful, I could pick certain parts and uh, by publishing it, comment on uh, what was going on at the same time 
uh, in my own life, in my own society. And uh, I think probably someone in, uh, in the UK, when they read John Locke, it's probably because not that it's, uh, it's not important, but uh, the issues that he have formulated uh, the issues so well that uh, some of those issues have been resolved in your uh, society. But uh, so you, some of those concerns, some of those uh, points may feel uh, somewhat dated, perhaps. I'm not sure, but uh, when I read that work, it was like this guy wrote uh, this letter for me. It, it, was, it felt so personal. I, I thought it was exactly about my situation and condition. And uh, that's what made it very personal. And I published it, of course, uh, under a pseudonym. And uh, a couple of years later, I found out that when John Locke, for the first time, published that letter, he published it. Uh, anonymously. That made it even more personal. What I'm saying is uh, a lot of the, these uh, classical literature or a lot of contemporary, I make uh, the example of uh, Eamon Butler's books, these uh, ideas feel very tangible, uh, they, very personal to an Iranian uh, readers, to Iranian readers. And uh, they, they feel so personal and that makes it so special. And that's uh, why probably there's so much demand for it. Yeah. And what can we in the West, whether as individuals, uh, as, as think tanks like the IEA, uh, NGOs, governments, what can we do to be uh, supportive uh, of the liberty movement in Iran as hopefully you are able to finally be rid of the regime and to set forth as a, a fledgling, a more liberal, democratic nation in the future? What, what can we do to help? I hope so. And uh, first of all, a lot of, as I mentioned before briefly, uh, a lot of laws, a lot of policies against the, against quote unquote Iran are not really, have, uh, typically have not been targeting the regime or some of the institutions within uh, the regime, like the IRGC, for example, the uh, Revolutionary Guards. They actually targeted people. I think a lot of, uh, we always talk about, when we talk about Iran, we usually, uh, talk about sanctions, a lot of sanctions are not really targeting the regime, but they're, they've been targeting people. I think, uh, especially think tanks and uh, organizations can start uh, the debate about those points. Uh, there are, of course, uh, I'm happy to report that there have been some developments. And uh, yesterday, uh, I'm sure you've heard that uh, uh, IRGC was recognized by EU as a terrorist group. But uh, imagine they just recognize IRGC as a terrorist, just. And uh, it is an achievement, uh, too late uh, it may be, but uh, I think there's much more to be done in that regard. Um, because uh, we have seen a lot of, uh, even when it comes to sanctions, and uh, I'm not advocating sanctions here, of course, but I'm, what I'm saying is if, you want to impose sanctions. Uh, they can be uh, designed much better in a much better way, more, much much more effective way, and uh, with Iranian people in mind. Because Iranian people are, I, I was recently I was talking uh, in a university in the states uh, about Iran, and someone mentioned that we don't know much uh, about the regime because uh, all we know is the hostage crisis. Uh, in early 80s. Yeah. And uh, my answer was, well, in that case, you know everything you need to know about the regime because uh, that is exactly the case when it comes to Iranian people uh, as well. Uh, Iranian people are hostage basically to this regime and uh, they cannot live as they wish, as uh, they want. And uh, 
they have been isolated uh, against the world. And uh, I hope uh, that the debate uh, starts and uh, continues to uh, on some of these matters. Excellent. Well, I'm afraid, Mohammed, that's all we've got time for today. Mohammed Mashi, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please feel free to give it a like uh, and a subscribe. I've been Harrison Griffiths, and thank you very much for joining us. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.